Ninth level spells are the highest level spells in the game, and since you usually don't get ninth level spell slots until level 17, most people don't get to use them very often. However, in case you do get to use them, here are some of the best ones you can possibly pick up. And at number 10, we have Psychic Scream. Psychic Scream is an AoE which affects up to 10 targets as you can see within 90 feet of you. And if they fail an intelligence saving throw, they take 14d6 psychic damage, and then they get stunned until they succeed that saving throw. And 14d6 damage for a 9th level spell slot is equivalent to casting Fireball at 9th level. So if all you care about is damage and you just like to upcast Fireball, then Psychic Scream will provide you the same amount of damage, while also having a stun component, and having a built-in no friendly fire clause since it only affects targets of your choice, just as long as they have an intelligence score of 2 or higher, which most things do. And the cool thing about the stun is that it can theoretically last forever as they don't get unstunned until they succeed an intelligence saving throw at the end of their turn. And also, if they die from the damage, their head explodes, which is just a neat bonus. However, there are some problems with this ability, mainly that it's compared to all other 9th level spells, and some of them are downright broken in comparison to a fireball that can stun. And also, if you just want to deal damage, there's another 9th level spell which deals way more damage than Psychic Scream, but doesn't have a built-in friendly fire suppressor like Psychic Scream. Although even then, there are other lower level spells you can cast which deal more damage than Psychic Scream. So, the main utility of picking up the spell is the fact that it has decent damage, since its damage is equivalent to a 9th level fireball, and it has that stun component, which is definitely the most useful part of it. Although with how broken some of the higher spots are, you'll see why this is at the lowest spot at number 10. And at number 9, we have Invulnerability. This spell has a very simple effect, probably the least amount of attacks out of all the 9th level spells where you're just straight up immune to damage until the spell ends. This spell itself lasts for 10 minutes and requires 500 gold to cast. However, when you're 17th level, 500 gold isn't that big of a deal. Although there is a little caveat to invulnerability, and the fact that it only makes you immune to damage and nothing else. So if you're targeted by negative effects which might control your character, like a psychic scream and you fail the saving throw, then you can still be stunned. Or have your character mind control with a dominate monster, or even charmed by a second level suggestion. Although most monsters in the monster manuals don't have super fancy special effects, so being able to make yourself immune to damage for 10 minutes will basically make you invincible to a lot of enemies. And the fact that it requires concentration isn't a big deal if you never take damage. So if you're a wizard and you want to fight the warlord barbarian of an enemy kingdom one on one, you could probably beat them with a dagger as long as you're able to deal enough damage within 10 minutes, as they won't be able to hurt you. And the utility of becoming immune to damage for 10 minutes is just very good. Especially since it can allow you to slowly whittle down any foe that doesn't have a way to control you outside of dealing damage. And at number 8, we have Mass Polymorph. This ability essentially allows you to cast the 4th level spell Polymorph on up to 10 different targets within 120 feet, and these targets can be friendly or unfriendly creatures, where if they're unfriendly they can succeed a saving throw in order to not be forcefully transformed. And when you transform something by the Polymorph spell, the game statistics including the mental ability scores are replaced by the statistics of the chosen beast, which means if you mass polymorph a group of enemy targets, you can just choose to turn them into a whole bunch of rats, and then just kind of ignore them for the whole hour. So it's basically a way to instantly disable up to 10 enemy targets, or act as a buffer to some of your teammates. Now, mass polymorph doesn't work exactly like the normal polymorph. There are a couple of key differences. For one, it allows you to turn a creature into a beast that has a challenge rating equal to its original challenge rating or lower, or if they are a player who has character levels instead, you can only turn them into a beast which has a CR rating equal to half or lower than their level. Whereas, the original Polymorph spell allows you to transform a player into an animal that has an equal amount of CR. You see, challenge ratings are not equal to character levels, as generally, a whole group of 5th level characters, for example, should be able to defeat a CR5 creature if they work together. So if you're able to turn one character into a CR5 creature at level 5, then they're instantly stronger than everyone else in their party because the CR ratings are slightly balanced around being fought by multiple characters. CR ratings aren't super balanced though, so this is kind of a rough estimation, but a monster's CR is almost always stronger than a player's character of the same level. And the other difference is that it only grants the polymorph targets temporary HP instead of giving them a second health bar. So with the original polymorph, they basically get the health of the animal they turn into, and then if they lose that health, they transform back into their original state and still have their original health as well. With Mass Polymorph, it instead just gives a target a number of temporary hit points equal to that beast's health, which is a difference because it doesn't allow you to do power word kill shenanigans, while still providing a lot of extra hit points to chew through if you're using it on a friendly target to give them extra health. 
And since you don't really get 9th level spells until level 17 anyway, if you want to use Mass Polymorph on your friends, you can still turn them all into T-Rexes if you want, since the T-Rex is only CR8, which is half of 16. Or Giant Apes if you want to keep their mental statistics, since the T-Rex only has an intelligence of 2, while the Giant Ape has an intelligence of 7, and is only 1 CR rating lower than a T-Rex. So if you want to turn everyone in your party into a T-Rex, I'm not sure how useful that would be if everyone's at 17th level. Which is kind of why Mass Polymorph is lower on this list rather than one of the best. It is a neat 9th level spell, but as 9th level spells go, it's not as good as some of the better ones, which is kind of a theme for some of the earlier spots on this list. They do really amazing things, it's, it's just they have to compete with some of the higher spots, which are even more amazing and downright broken. But if you really like the idea of turning your party into T-Rexes, that way you can get the extra 130 temporary hit points, then this is definitely something that could be done. Although most monsters you fight in tier 4 levels will be immune to the damage of a T-Rex, so there's always that to worry about. And at number 7, we have Time Stop. This ability allows you to stop time for 1d4 plus 1 turns, where you're able to take a number of turns equal to the amount of turns you're able to stop time, unless you do an action which affects another creature or object, or if you move more than 1,000 feet from where you cast the spell. So Time Stop can be an excellent way for you to just get out of any situation, because there's not much anyone can do about you stopping time and just running away. One of the most useful applications of the ability, though, is being able to set up a whole bunch of buffs on yourself. Which is why there's lots of theory crafting online about which are the best abilities you can cast during a time stop, which make your character a lot more effective mid-combat, which is usually not possible unless you're able to prep before combat for whatever reason. So if you want to use time stop to just buff yourself, you can use it on things like mage armor, mirror image, blur, fire shield, invisibility, true scene, or even crown of stars. Generally, you want to go for buffs that don't require concentration, and then maybe one buff that requires concentration. If you want to use it to do damage, what you can do is just use every turn to cast o 2 Freezing Sphere into the little globe form. Then just have your fighter in the group come over to you and pick them all up and sling them at an opponent with their multi-attack. Or, if you want a creative combo, you could cast Sickening Radiance on something and then just put them in a force cage, since Sickening Radiance doesn't actually affect the creature until their turn starts. It won't end the time stop prematurely. Alternatively, you can sub out Sickening Radiance with Cloud Kill, Delayed Blast Fireball, Bigsby's Hand, Contingency, or Faithful Hound, as all of those don't immediately end Time Stop either, and can be used before a Force Cage in order to trap a creature inside with one of those effects. So there's lots of fun things you can do in a Time Stop even with its limitations, although it definitely requires a lot of prep work beforehand, since it's real easy to accidentally end Time Stop early if you're just blasting things. And at number 6, we have Foresight. This ability allows you to buff a creature so they gain advantage in all their attack rolls, ability checks, and saving throws for 8 hours. Additionally, they can't be surprised, and other creatures have disadvantage on attack rolls against them. And since you can cast it on other people, and it doesn't require concentration, it's just an excellent spell to cast in one of your martial classes. More specifically, someone who has an ability like Sharpshooter or Great Weapon Master, where they regularly take a minus 5 to their attack rolls in order to deal much more damage. So if you give this to a fighter with Sharpshooter, they'll have advantage in all of their attack rolls and be much more likely to actually land some of those big hits, while also having really good protection since it gives them advantage on saving throws and disadvantage on attack rolls against them. It's basically one of the best buff spells you can give someone in a game, because the effect itself is just really good for pretty much every class, and it basically lasts for a full adventuring day. One of the problems with 9th level spell slots is that you usually only get one of them, so if that one spell's effect can benefit someone for an entire adventuring day, then you get a lot of mileage out of it, which just makes Foresight one of the good ones to pick up. And at number 5, we have Meteor Swarm. This ability is just a giant AoE, which with a 1 mile range allows you to designate 4 different points you can see, where each creature that's within 40 foot radius of those points takes 40 d6 damage, half fire and half bludgeoning if they fail a saving throw, or half as much on a success. This spell only affects a creature one time total, so you can't pedal one target four times. However, even with each creature only being hit once, Meteor Swarm is the hardest hitting single target ability in the game, dealing 140 damage on average, while also being a gigantic AoE. It has the potential to be the hardest hitting AoE spell as well, but Storm of Vengeance, another 9th level spell, technically hits way more targets, so it might lose out to Storm of Vengeance and doing the most amount of damage for a spell being cast, or maybe not. But whatever the case, if all you want to do is just use your 9th level spell slot for some bombastic damage, Meteor Swarm is the go-to spell. It just kind of blows Psychic Scream out of the water when it comes to dealing damage. Although, Psychic Scream has the benefit where you can allow it to not hit friendly targets, 
whereas Meteor Swarm hits everything, and has such a large radius that this chance to hit one of your party members unintentionally is pretty high. And at number 4, we have Shape Change. This ability is like a polymorph that you can only cast on yourself, where you can turn to any creature that has a challenge rating equal to your level or lower, just as long as it's not a construct or undead, and you've seen that creature at least once. And what's great about this ability is it allows you to turn into things besides beasts, as generally, beasts in the monster manual are kind of balanced around the fact that they know players gain access to these beasts through a whole bunch of different kinds of spells and abilities. Other creatures don't really have these same balance restrictions or limitations. So most non-beast creatures are just stronger than other beasts of the same challenge rating. And Shape Change also allows you to keep your mental statistics, as you don't lose your intelligence, wisdom, or charisma score. But you gain the creatures pretty much everything else, their health, special abilities, innate spellcasting if they have any, but not legendary actions or layer actions. And lastly, every turn you're allowed to change your Shape Change into something else with the only restriction that you can't gain any more hit points than you gain from your first form. So you can't constantly swap forms in order to get a new health bar every turn. But you can swap forms to whatever you want every turn to gain new abilities or different innate spells. Because as a little distinction, you can't use a creature's spellcasting trait, but you can use the innate spellcasting trait if the creature has it. So if you turn into a planeteer, for example, you're able to cast all of its spells since it has the innate spellcasting trait just as long as none of them require concentration, because you're concentrating on a spell to do this. And the Planeteer is just a really good option to turn into, too. It can also use Healing Touch four times a day, it has passive True Sight, and the ability to passively know if someone is lying, so an excellent out-of-combat tool for social situations. It adds extra Radiant damage to all of its attacks, and it has a baseline fly speed of 120 feet, which is really good. With this, you can fly in, attack something, and then go behind full cover every turn. Some other creatures you can turn into with innate spells include the Elder Brain, the Ultra Loth, or the Rakshasa, in order to gain its limited spell immunity. You can also turn into a Purple Worm in order to create tunnels that your party can follow behind. You can turn into a Merolith to have a reaction every turn in combat, or just go into an adult gold dragon for fun, which is one of the strongest dragons you can turn into that you can possibly turn into at your level, which also has this shape change feature. You also gain the legendary resistances that a creature has, so every time you shape change into a new one, you get all of those new legendary resistances, as it doesn't prevent you from using those, only legendary actions. So shape change has a lot of really good creatures you can turn into, in a lot of very versatile situations, to kind of become a better creature than whatever your character is, honestly. And at number 3, we have Prismatic Wall. This is a spell which is kind of like a stronger force cage, and is definitely the final form of the spells which allow you to trap creatures or create barriers like Wall of Force or Force Cage. And what it does is summon a wall that's 90 feet long, 30 feet high, and 1 inch thick. Or you create a sphere with a diameter of 30 feet. And wherever you designate the wall within 60 feet, if the wall passes through any creatures when it's forming, then the wall will just fail to form and your spell slot will be wasted. Which is kind of extreme since Force Cage just pushes creatures outside of it if it hits any creatures, but whatever. Prismatic Wall's pretty big, so you can pretty easily just put this over a creature as long as it fits within the 30-foot dome if you're trying to trap it. When you create the wall, you can designate any friendly targets you want to be immune to its effects, so they can just pass through it no problem. And if an enemy creature tries to go through the wall, then it's subjugated to all seven of its layers' effects, where each of its layers has its own description of what it does and how much damage it deals, where it deals a total of 50 d6 damage if you go through all seven layers, and has a chance to petrify, blind, and teleport a target to another dimension in the process. So it deals an average of 175 damage to a creature that walks through all seven layers, and it's the ultimate spell in order to force creatures to walk through it. If you combo this with a reverse gravity trap, and place a dome above your opponent's enemies' heads, as you can put it in the air, then if they fail the reverse gravity and fall into it, they'll go through the wall two times as they fall into the air. Then you can just end reverse gravity in order for them to fall again through the two walls of the dome. And there's not too many creatures which can survive going through a prismatic wall four times. Alternatively, you can just create it like a wall and just get a lot of mileage out of abilities that allow you to push creatures through it, or just trap them in a dome, and you'll have 10 minutes before the wall goes away, since the wall can't be dispelled normally and is immune to anti-magic effects. Plus, one of the layers blocks all spells from going through. As the way you destroy the wall normally is you have to deal at least 25 points of cold damage to break its red layer, then you have to use a strong wind in order to destroy its orange layer. Then deal 60 points of force damage to destroy the yellow layer. Just a reminder, with all these damage values, you kind of have to do all the damage at once. 
unless your DM allows you to deal the damage accumulative. So it's pretty obvious the yellow layer was designed to be hit with a disintegration spell. Then if you wish to break the green layer, you have to use the pass wall spell, which is a fifth level random spell that you probably won't have, or some similar effect in order to break it. Then you have to deal 25 fire damage to the blue wall, cast the daylight spell or a similar spell in order to break the indigo wall, and finally the violet wall can be broken with dispel magic. So the way you actually destroy this wall normally is akin to running a puzzle or encounter, and is an excellent spell to give a villain if you're a DM running a campaign, in order to force the players to work together finding ways to destroy the wall. Of course, if you're a player and just using this on an opponent, chances are an average enemy is not going to have all the beans to destroy all seven layers, and will have to find some other way around the wall or just kind of brute force through all the damage and hope they don't get petrified. The Prismatic Wall has the potential to be one of the highest damage dealing single target abilities in the game, although it definitely requires creative use in order to force an enemy to actually try to go through it. And since you can designate friendly players to not be affected by the wall at all, you can just have your party members go in and out of the wall in order to attack and hide behind it for full protection. This powerful and incredibly complicated ability is definitely worth a 9th level spell slot, as you can kind of build a whole campaign around the ability to an extent, or at least make a very exciting final boss fight with it. And at number 2, we have True Polymorph. This spell allows you to turn a creature or object into any creature or object you want, although with a couple of rules and stipulations depending on what you're trying to turn them into. And also, if you're able to maintain concentration on this transformation for a full hour, then the effect becomes permanent. So if you're level 17 and have the ability to cast the spell, what you can do is turn yourself into an adult gold dragon. And the gold dragon can use its shape change feature to turn into something else. So if you want, you can turn yourself permanently into an adult gold dragon, and then have the ability to use its shape change spell that I talked about earlier. Basically, an unlimited amount of times per day. And then once you get to level 20, you can instead turn into an ancient brass dragon, who is able to accomplish the same thing. Although you'll only be able to turn to CR20 and lower creatures. And some caveats to being able to shape change as a dragon, is that the dragon shape change doesn't grant them any extra health. And also it does not allow you to turn back into yourself with all of your spell slots, as True Polymorph completely replaces all of your statistics with the new form. So what you can't do is transform yourself into Adult Gold Dragon, and then use its shape change feature to turn yourself back into your normal form in order to try to keep your spell slots in addition to the new Gold Dragon's health. Although, if you turn into an Adult Gold Dragon and then use its ability shape change to turn into something else that has spells, like the Planeteer, then you can use those spells in the new form. So if you wanted to, you could just take about a week in order to turn everyone in your party into an adult gold dragon. That way they gain the benefits of the shape change ability, or just being a gold dragon with its breath weapons and strong melee capabilities. Or not, because they do lose their character statistics and can't really do anything else that the gold dragon can't already do. Now, outside of gold dragons, what you can also do with true polymorph is transform objects into creatures. And an object transformed into a creature in this way is friendly to in your party for the full duration. Although after the effect's duration ends and the effect becomes permanent, then the creature itself gets to choose if it wants to stay friendly to you or not. And if you transform an object into a creature, it can only be CR 9 or lower. So this turns True Polymorph into basically a summon spell that allows you to transform a random rock or tree nearby into a CR 9 or lower creature. And some of the best creatures you can choose are the Young Silver Dragon, if you just want a beat stick. Or if you want some spells, you can transform them into an Evoker or an Abjurer who have a lot of good spells that they can cast. The War Priest, if you need someone to heal your party, or the Hashalak Kori, which has the ability to possess something or cast Dominate Monster. And if your party is just really good at convincing the creature to stay friendly to you, you could spend a full week in order to have an army of 10 young silver dragons at your beck and call. Or just a whole extra party of adventurers, if you give yourself a War Priest, Invoker, and then a Champion. And then finally, you can transform creatures into objects, just as long as they're not magical objects. So, if you simply transform an enemy creature into an object that is required as part of a spell component, since most of those aren't magic objects, which consumes that object as part of the spell component, like, say, a diamond worth 300 gold, which then can be used in order to cast Revivify, consuming the component and thereby destroying whatever creature you turned into an object. Although, seeing as most boss monsters have legendary resistances, they'll probably just use it in order to avoid being turned into something. So this isn't an excellent way to instantly defeat a big boss monster, but it is a pretty metal way to defeat pretty much anything else. 
So, True Polymorph allows you to turn your whole party into adult gold dragons if you want. Or if you have a whole bunch of sidekicks with you that you picked up through your campaign, you can turn them into adult gold dragons instead, or, you know, other dragons in case they have lower levels, so that your other level 17 party members don't lose all of their full abilities. Or you can create an army of young silver dragons by just turning rocks or trees into dragons, or just turning an enemy creature into a material component and then just consuming it to destroy them instantly. There's a lot of very strong things you can perform with the spell, which would probably make it one of the strongest spells in the game if it wasn't for the number one spot, because there's so many other things you can do with True Polymorph, like turn someone into the CR 16 creature to Tiphilus, who can cast Animate Dead at will, so you can have your very own undead army. The limitations are pretty much up to whatever your DM allows you to do, because remember, if the only thing your DM requires of you is to have seen the creature in order to transform them into it, as the spell itself doesn't have that requirement even though shape change does, if you're a 17th level adventurer, you should have access to some kind of scrying or clairvoyance in order to see any of these creatures. And at number one, we have the Wish Spell. The Wish Spell basically turns you into a reality warper. As by default, the spell allows you to cast any spell of 8th level or lower while ignoring its materials or cast time. And outside of that, you can instead just use Wish for whatever you want. But whether that succeeds is entirely up to your DM. So if your DM lets you do literally whatever you want with Wish, you could use the Wish spell to completely end the campaign immediately and have all of your characters retire rich. Although there's always a downside where if you try to Wish for something outside of 8th level or lower spells, there is a 33% chance you won't be able to cast Wish ever again. So, let's go over some of the benefits of Wish if you only choose 8th level or lower spells to cast. One of the best things you can do is just cast Simulacrum, creating a copy of yourself. Then this new Simulacrum will have your 9th level spell slot, and you can use the Simulacrum in order to cast Wish for one of the options that's not an 8th level or lower spell. Normally, Simulacrum costs 1500 gold to cast and has a long 12 hour cast time. So, you'd need the gold to do this for the first time, but you could just have your Simulacrum use the first Wish option to create 25,000 gold and then get your money back, and make a 23,500 gold profit, which can be used to fund more Simulacrums to cast more Wishes. And your Simulacrum is a separate entity from you and can't regain spell slots, so if it loses the ability to cast Wish, that's not a problem, as you just create another one tomorrow. So if you have some prep, what you can do is create a new Simulacrum every day then have that Simulacrum use one of the fun effects of Wish, under the options of what you can cast outside of spells, in order to grant everyone in your party resistance to all types of damage, one type per casting of the spell per day, or just summon an enormous pile of cash every day, 25,000 gold at a time. And you can also grant everyone in your party immunity to a spell for 8 hours, which you can do right before a big boss fight. And these are things you can do without your DM being able to invoke monkey paw shenanigans, as they are listed within the spell itself as things it can just do. If you try to do something else, then the spell itself encourages the DM to just judge whether the spell happens or not, or to do something creative with how it fails, or to simply tell you that the spell fails because of what you're trying to wish for is just too much. So granting everyone your party resistance to all damage, with the simulacrum every day, is something you can totally do with rules as written, although it's definitely one of the cheesiest things you can do. Alternatively, you can cast Hallow instantly, which normally has a 24 hour cast time, and can make it so five types of creatures can't harm your party, and also make it so enemy creatures have vulnerability to a type of damage of your choice. You can cast Resurrection without material components, in order to more cheaply bring someone back to life. You can cast Awaken on a tree in order to have a Trent, or cast a Planner Binding at 8th level in order to control a creature for 180 days. As you are able to cast the spell you're duplicating up to the 8th level, instead of just its base level. So Wish is the ultimate spell where it's even broken within its rules as written, and becomes even more broken if your DM is a lot more lenient with what they allow you to wish for. So Wish is easily the best 9th level spell in the game, and you can run your entire campaigns around characters trying to find items that allow them to cast the spell a single time. Alright, and that's the video. Eventually I'll have videos on all the best spells for each level, so look forward to those. If you have ideas for future videos just like this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments. And also remember to don't not subscribe.